So yeah, just to double Diane's uh, remarks, you guys did great yesterday. It was thrilling to see um, uh, the presenters, uh, the innovators, and then the interactions uh, that you had during the impact groups were exactly how we had imagined it. You know, we've done this two times uh, before, but really, you guys really stepped up, and it was just great to see. Um, Open-minded, constructive um, uh, conversations, real opportunities. Um, we really look forward to it today. And um, now, uh, um, I'd like to make an introduction um, uh, from a man who actually doesn't need an introduction, but I will anyway. Social entrepreneur, global health ambassador, longtime friend of launch. Now add to these uh, Jimmy, Buffett, Jimmy Buffett fan and pool shark, Mikel Vestergaard. Do I have a pointer? I actually made one PowerPoint slide. Good. Perfect. We're starting off well today. Um, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do and how I got involved in, in Launch. And um, one of the uh, interesting things that came out of Launch Water, which we've taken a lot further from there. Um, so just briefly about uh, my company. It's, it's a story about a company that has, uh, that has built a business around the opportunity to save lives and the rising understanding that there's neither controversy nor conflict between doing business and doing good. And what we've done um, is to focus our entire innovative platform uh, towards technological breakthroughs for the most vulnerable people in often the most extreme situations. And I'm going to just give you three quick examples of, of that. Uh, the first example is in malaria. We invented, uh, through fiber technology, um, a mosquito net where we put the insecticides inside the fiber of the net so that when a mosquito lands on the net, it's killed on impact and it's still safe for humans. Um, such a uh, product has the potential to save millions of lives uh, throughout Africa and greatly improve the economy too as malaria would otherwise rampage through African villages, leaving survivors too sick to work or too sick to go to school. In 2009, we uh, saw how uh, malaria was reduced to less than half in more than five African countries. This was largely due to the large-scale rollout of this bed net. In 2010, we, together with our partners, one of them, uh, USAID, who's here today, in 2010, we got more than 100 million nets out distributed in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, uh, when today we're talking about less than 800,000 people are dying from malaria per year, this is a lot, but it's a significant reduction from the more than a million uh, that were dying from malaria uh, when I was here at Launch Water two years ago. So remarkable results have been achieved in that space. Uh, through a great partnerships and, and great innovation. Uh, the second one that I want to talk about quickly is our work in neglected tropical diseases. Uh, schistosomiasis, filariasis, uh, trypanosomiasis, snails, worms, and parasites um, are all involved in, in, in tropical diseases and neglected tropical diseases specifically. Uh, the one that, that I'm personally very passionate about is, is our more than a decade long uh, fight to eradicate the guinea worm. Blank stare suggests that I'll quickly tell what a guinea worm is. Um, the comes into your body at larvae stage, grows to be about a meter long, comes in through drinking water, um, grows to be about a meter long inside your body, and then it needs to get out. And it will get out through your thigh or your chest or your neck or anywhere. And it's a very burning sensation. You can't just yank it out because then it will break, stay inside your body, rot, and that's when you die. So you need to take it out slowly. But it burns, so you want to linder the pain, and you put it in water, and that's when this transmission repeats itself. So, um, by, uh, so together with, with the um, Carter Center, uh, led by um, former president uh, Jimmy Carter, um, we have been involved for one and a half decade now in, in the uh, guinea worm eradication program. Uh, something, as I mentioned, I'm very passionate about because I think the world has dropped the ball on disease eradication since smallpox was eradicated in the late 70s. This is not only going to be the second disease ever to be eradicated, it's going to be the first disease to be eradicated without the use of a vaccine. 
uh, the cornerstone in this eradication program is a very simple particle filter that we developed um, together with the Carter Center, a, a very good partnership that we had with them, both on uh, finances on, and on tool development and on distribution. But that you can do so much with such a simple particle filter uh, was an eye-opener for us. And knowing that 6,000 people, mainly children, die every day of waterborne-related diseases, of water-related diseases, uh, and that women and girls are deprived of dignity and education because they, went, they spent their lives fetching water rather than going to school, and that more than a billion people are left without access to safe drinking water, there's a lot more to be done there. We developed LifeStraw as a potential response to the water crisis. Uh, LifeStraw was awarded Time Magazine's Invention of the Year, uh, Gizmax Invention of the Century, and, and, and more than 30 uh, international awards, none of which really matter unless such a tool is out in the hands of the people who need it the most. And that, for me, is where the real innovation is. So I came to launch water and had invented LifeStraw. We started scaling that up. We would also invented a product that was called LifeStraw Family, which served a family of five or six people with uh, safe drinking water for, uh, for years. We talked about this in, in a couple of the impact groups yesterday, the need to remove repeat intervention. LifeStraw Family has done that. So it works for years without the need for spare parts, electricity, and maintenance. But we were having this conversation inside, in our company, about innovative financing to go to scale with water purification and where to tap into innovative financing, sustainable financing, because it's going to be a long, drawn battle um, to, to have an impact on the water crisis. And we were um, uh, looking at the uh, global carbon market but without re really being able to find the, the handle on that pool of innovative financing. So at Launch Water, I met with uh, NASA astronaut Ron Garan, who at the time had already embarked on, with his foundation, MANA Foundation, that had started an arm, uh, MANA Energy, a private arm, MANA Energy, and they had embarked on a, a, prog a program in, in Rwanda, where with community water purification, they were trying to get carbon credits because they could uh, document the uh, reduced boiling of water. And um, Ron and I uh, talked about the potential for us to cooperate as we were sitting in the impact groups. And it was within 40 seconds that we immediately knew. I remember you came over to ring a bell at some point that, that you know, we had a home run there. Uh, we immediately knew that you know, there's something here. Um, and and it's, it's the kind of uh, feeling that I had with, with a couple of you yesterday. There's something here that we need to explore. Um, so we explored this further. Uh, the problem that MANA Energy had was that uh, the, the time to get clearance with UNFCCC uh, was not month, it was years, and they were running out of cash in Rwanda. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, and the issue that, that we had, we had the, the capacity uh, through uh, health campaigns in, in Kenya that we run before, and a tool that was household focused rather than community focused so we could quicker go to scale. So we figured, why not um, help you with the financing? You come and help us with the knowledge, and we'll do this together. Um, so when we went uh, and did the, did the baseline in, um, in Kenya, we ran into uh, Sharon here. Sasa kulikuwa la boshi nyingi nyingi. Sasa ilikuwa la bidi tulale. Kasema ah. Alafu bidi ndio ndio tuko hiyo boshi haiwezekani. Sasa kama walapika hivyo. Boshi kisha ingia. Shaenda kulala. Shida kupungua. Ye jumba. Ukutalia black. I was really coffee. The chest was not good. And then I went to the hospital and they take me the x-ray. 
Nilikuwa na kifua alafu na tibi. So just to give you a, a little taste of, of the issue that we're dealing with, um, because the pollution that we want to battle by re reducing uh, boiling and replacing that with water filtration, it's actually indoor air pollution. And uh, so it's not only uh, diarrhea we're fighting, it's also, um, uh, it's also uh, a large element of lung health. Uh, Sharon, unfortunately, um, uh, passed away a couple of months after we filmed this, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, in May this year, uh, we embarked on, on the campaign that we call Carbon for Water uh, in Kenya, uh, where we went door to door over five weeks to 900,000 houses. Um, in, in every house, we installed a water filter um, and installed the water filter for free. The education was free. It, and uh, if uh, the water filter would break down, service and repair would be free. And what we're, what we're doing is, this was a $30 million investment from, from my company's side. What we're doing is then monitoring the, uh, the amount of filtration, monitoring the reduced amount of water boiled, the reduced amount of wood burned and the reduced amount of forest thinned, and then claiming carbon credits on that. I'm briefly going to show you a clip from the campaign. Less than 10% of people around Kakamega Forest get clean tap water. So you can imagine more than 90% of the rest of the people get water from streams and rivers. This is untreated water. So these people have to boil the water before they consume it. Even if you tell them, boil this water, the firewood has to be bought. This is a community who earn their living on uh, 50 shillings per day. Sometimes we used to boil, but sometimes we do not have enough firewood. Most of them don't uh, treat their waters and uh, they encounter diseases like diarrhea diseases and typhoid. In the house, the ventilation is poor. By morning, the child is really sick. Boiling water means that we also have other gases being produced, for example, carbon monoxide, and this contributes to the greenhouse gases and hence to global warming. So the project grew out of a conversation we had about how do you link access to clean water with a financing mechanism that can be sustained over a longer period. Well, you can't tackle things in a silo. Everything's interlinked. And the beauty about this integration is that the climate part actually pays for the health part. So the way the project works, Best Regard Franson is distributing 900,000 Lifejaw family water filters door to door across the Western province over five weeks. As everybody starts filtering water and reduce the need for boiling water, less firewood will be burned, and less tree will be chopped. We're able to reduce emissions by about two million tons a year. That emission reduction is a tangible value on the global carbon market. And we're selling this to trading desks and energy companies and in banks. For us, this is an investment. We're not getting paid a cent until six months later when we can document how much water was consumed, how much less water was boiled, how much less firewood was burned. And the more we're able to achieve in terms of behavior change and health impact, the more we're able to sustain the project and grow it. And we're planning to be here for decades and stay here until the government has built a pipeline and, and ensured that every home has access to municipal water. They'll now have safe water, and it would not cost them anything. We really would thank the Vestacat group because it's really helping this community. This is what we do best, combining our ability to do business and do good. So tell me why, why? There are, um, yeah, this looks a little commercial, so... I'm, I'm tempted to say, if you buy now, you'll get this free knife set. Um, there are uh, five things that are very unique with this campaign. Uh, first and foremost, this is the, this is the first ever um, uh, tangible link between 
the carbon market and a water program. Uh, we became, uh, with our Kenya household level program, the first company to tap with water program into, into the carbon market. And MANA became the first um, company to tap into the UNFCCC, the certified market, with their community um, uh, water uh, uh, campaign. Um, it also drove a lot of innovative financing to public health. This campaign alone, uh, we expect to reduce um, uh, diarrhea-related mortality with 5,000 children um, per year. And on top of that, there is the uh, reduction in mortality related to uh, uh, lung diseases, uh, respiratory infection primarily. The second thing that is uh, unique about this is the sustainability part. Not just because we've committed for 10 years, but because we expect this to be profitable. And I'll get back to the objectives that we have for this campaign. The third thing is the sustainability, sorry, the, uh, the scale of this. We hired 8,000 people to go door to door to 900,000 houses. Uh, that is a fairly unique scale for a, uh, not just for, for a carbon project, but certainly also for a health project. Um, with 8,000 people door to door in five weeks and another 4,000 people for the uh, education campaigns every six months, uh, the scale of this is, uh, is enormous. And just to uh, give you a little sense of the impact that this has in the market, on the voluntary market, we expect to be about 18% of the, of the global voluntary market with this one campaign. Uh, and with this one campaign, we expect to reduce carbon emission reduction by a bit more than 2 million tons per year. Uh, the fourth thing that is very unique about this is pay for performance. Pay for performance is something that is uh, becoming increasingly relevant in uh, public health campaigns. Anybody who's worked with, with public health has heard uh, uh, program managers talk about, well, if Coca-Cola can get out to this corner of Africa and reach all these consumers and put a Coke bottle on top of Kilimanjaro and do X, Y, C, why can't we? Well, the truth is, or I think the truth is, that Coca-Cola doesn't get paid until they reach the consumer. And we need in, in, in health campaigns to adopt the same mindset. And we, with the emerging of the carbon market and the public health market, you have a pay for performance model that does just this. 4,000 of the people that we had employed were community health workers. We gave each of them a smartphone so that when they came to a home, they would record the name of the person in the home. Uh, it was in more than 90% of the cases a woman. Uh, her cell phone number, uh, there was this, we heard yesterday that's 80% cell phone coverage in, in Western Kenya, um, which is also what, what our uh, data suggests. But we recorded the cell phone number so that we can reach out with, with additional health messages. The number of people per house which makes our data set more accurate than national census. The GPS coordinates for that house where we gave that, uh, that water filter. And a photograph as um, evidence of receipt of the water filter with that person at that GPS coordinate with that barcode of the water filter so that the information circle is complete. And that would be uploaded in a file and we would receive 35,000 uh, files in real time upload it that we could use to manage the campaign per day, 35,000 files per day in real time. This, the, the sixth element that, that, sorry, the fifth element that I would say is, is highly unique here is that I think we're doing an important correction. The carbon market was originally set out to, uh, to uh, trigger investments in clean technology, but as uh, countries need to be developed and companies need to be polluting in order to be incentivized to clean up. Less than 3% of the global market, uh, carbon market goes via the least developed countries. So we have an opportunity here to make a correction to that. I briefly mentioned earlier the objectives. So I just want to talk about that because we're being audited first week of December. 
um, an external auditor will come in and look at our data set and say, you know, did you perform or did you not perform? Is this a business now or is it not, not a business? And is it, is it a sustainable finance model or not? Our objective for on coverage was to reach 90% of uh, all households in Western Kenya. With 886,000 houses, we reached 91.3%, uh, uh, so a little bit more than 4 million people. Our objective for regular use was that 80% of those who received the life straw would use it at least twice per week, including safe storage so that there was continued use. Uh, we're at 84 point something right now. Our objective for consumption was that we would get people to consume four liters per person per day. And we're at 3.6 now. Adding these figures up, we're 97% on target. So I hope that our auditors will, will agree with us when we, when we get to that. Um, I had a discussion with David Ferguson uh, yesterday about uh, M&E, monitoring and evaluation. Because I think that, that not only does, does this uh, become an innovative finance piece for public health, uh, but it also pushes the needle on, on monitoring and evaluation. Because with such a rigorous M&E uh, piece where 4,000 people equipped with smart smartphones are going door to door, take a BetNet program. You don't have to go as a donor through this tedious process of giving money up front to a country, hoping that they would spend it well procuring bed nets, distributing it to the people in the most transparent and efficient way. With such M&E, you can, you can simply, uh, as a donor, go in and only pay per night a child sleeps under a bed net. And that, I think, is pushing the needle on, on global development. And I think this is an important learning from here. So, so the, imp the, the potential for bilaterals to no longer upfront money but to buy shares in an impact that's already documented. That's what I hope we can get out of this as a conversation. Um, I mentioned that I'll go back to, to Sharon, because one important learning uh, from this, and if one of NASA, knowing that one of NASA's, NASA's mission is to learn from space how to improve life on Earth, and that this is really what gathers us here at, at launch, I think the, the most important learning that I got out of this, um, we did uh, the uh, microplanning in Western Province, thinking that there were 3.3 million people. Our microplanning data did not add up with uh, national census. And after several conversations with the government, that figure was corrected to 4.5 million people. And that got me really curious about population growth. When Kenya became independent in 1969, there were 3 million Kenyans. There's more than 40 million today. Not really sure how accurate that number even is. But with projections of the most conservative ones are saying um, 100 million by 2050, and more aggressive ones are saying a quarter billion by 2050. Either way, this is an unsustainable growth. And it is becoming the epicenter of, of what my company is dealing with in water, food security, climate change, and public health. The epicenter of this is, po is population growth. But if you're in Kenya, you're in an environment where you can't by law say one child per family because it's a culture that is so strong when it comes to having children. The only viable option that we have here is through strong investments in health and education so that families can have the social demographic transitions of choosing to have fewer children because they know that the few they have will survive. Thank you.